Hey everybody, I am back with Dr. Mark Hyman, who you obviously recognize from the movie. Uh, he's the chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine, a multiple New York Times bestseller, and uh, just wonderful warrior out there doing the right thing for all of us. Dr. Hyman, hello. Hi, how you doing? Fantastic. Thanks for being here. Uh, I know how busy you are, and uh, you're out there, uh, you know, just fighting this fight. The Fed Up movie just, uh, you know, has come out, you know, a I don't know, what, two, three months now? I don't, I don't know how long it's been, but Fed Up is out there. It's doing great work, and you're kind of one of the prominent faces in that movie as well. Um, and uh, you've been talking this stuff for a long time. <laughs> long time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. You know, they say you know, you, everything seems new, but it really it's like a, a, it's been going on for decades. And finally, the voices are being heard. I think that's what's happening is, is people are listening. It's, it, the problem is getting so big, so massive, you know, that, that everybody has to pay attention, you know, politicians and Everybody, the average person gets it that, you know, we spend 84% of our $2.8 trillion on chronic disease, mostly lifestyle preventable, and it's crippling our economy, it's damaging our environment, it's ruining our health, it's affecting our lives, it's affecting our productivity, our national com global competitiveness, our national security. All these are affected by what we eat and how we live, and, and there's solutions there. And then the problem is the food industry is so massive. It's so big. It's $1 trillion dollars. Its lobby power is so strong that it really subverts a lot of the things that are the right thing to do. Yeah, that's the part that um, you've been talking for a very long time, and I, I kind of want our audience to understand how this works because you know it's one thing to say the food system's messed up, but. Uh, most mm -hmm. people don't realize how things kind of go down in Washington. It's like, you know, yeah. we, we could say, I don't want my kids to eat sugary cereals and get marketed to in the morning. Yeah. And then, boom, every time we, you know, every time we turn that corner, there's five lobbyists there to, to change yeah. Congress's mind. It's true. I was, I was talking to a Republican Secretary of Agriculture uh, who was under Bush, and she's now working for a bipartisan policy institute, and she's very much focused on the issues of obesity and and social change. And I said to her, when you were Secretary of Agriculture, tell me how was it? Because you knew that we spent $4 billion a year on food stamps for the poor to drink soda. We're, we're putting $4 billion in the pockets of soda makers like Pepsi and Coke to make soda available for the poor. On the front end, on the back end, we're paying for Medicare and Medicaid for obesity and diabetes. Why couldn't you change that? And I said, you knew that, for example, there's no evidence that shows that the average American should be drinking three glasses of milk a day, according to the U.S. dietary guidelines, or that we know that sugar is harmful. Why isn't that in the dietary guidelines? Despite the fact that there was an 80-page research and analytic report from scientists to the last committee saying that we should have sugar as a problem in our diet, and we should name it so. And it was out. It was taken out. So why, why is that? She says because, because the food lobby has a lock on Congress and the White House. And wow. it's, it's, un, it's almost impossible to make those changes. In fact, we just had the grass ruling on, on trans fats. We've known for 30 years that trans fats kill 30,000 people a year. That's more than Ebola and AIDS and <laughs> terrorism and everything else. <laughs> and yet, and yet uh, we, we just recently had it ruled as a non-grass substance. That means not generally recognized as safe. I mean, it's not a safe food addict. That just happened. And, but it's going to give the food companies four or five years to actually roll it in. Now they're talking about rolling it back and changing it back to safe substance because of the power of the food lobby. Well, that's <laughs> a, it's, it's like, here we have a chance to you know, save many lives, more than we would save from, again, AIDS and Ebola and terrorism. But we won't do it because of the food lobby. So you're a medical doctor. You've been doctoring people for a very long time and helping on that end. And yeah, well, here we are talking about Washington and <laughs> politics, right? And so how is it that when the medical system gets kind of uh, trumped by the food system and we're dealing with all of these like just basically shrapnel on the floor, I mean, everyone coming in, I mean, uh, you know, lifestyle disease is preventable, period. So here we are talking about policy change because, you know, we don't stand a chance unless these, these uh, lobbies are shifted around. No, it's true. You know, I'm a doctor, so why do I care about politics, right? Why aren't I just in my yeah. office treating patients? You know, and the reason is that the problems that I see in my office are the direct result of our food system and our policies. It's, it's not the person's fault that they're sick. It's not some random act of God, they got struck by lightning and they're in the emergency room. It's because of what we eat and the food we produce 
and how, how we grow it and how we consume it are driving 90% of the healthcare problems in this country. And they're solvable. And it's not just in terms of prevention, bedroom. It's actually treatment. That's what's so exciting. I mean, I was, I was uh, in, in Cleveland. We just opened this Center for Functional Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. And Toby Cosgrove is one of the most visionary and innovative leaders in healthcare today. Because I went up to him and I said, Toby, what if I could empty out half your hospitals, cut your bypasses and angioplasties in half? Would you think that's a good idea? And he's like, yes, that's exactly what we need to do. And, and then he called me up after that. I saw him at an event. And he's like, would you come to Cleveland and help us do that? Because that's what we need to do. That's the future of healthcare. We need to do the right thing. Wow. Even if we lose money. Because we'll figure out another way to make money. I said, okay. So now I'm at Cleveland and we're implementing this program to really change the way we think about healthcare and expand it beyond the four walls of the clinic and the hospital, doing community wellness programs and so on. And it, and I was giving a talk in the, in the community the other night when we were doing Screening Fed Up. And this guy says, Dr. Hyman, you know, I read your book and I did your program, The Blood Sugar Solution. And I lost 100 pounds. I got off 100 units of insulin. And I can walk again and have a life. <laughs> I thought I was headed for a wheelchair. And now I'm you know, headed for the golf course. That is a huge change in biology that happens not as a result of better drugs or surgery or treatment, but as a result of understanding how to use functional medicine and lifestyle medicine as treatment. It seems like there's such a loss of hope over how the world goes. I mean, you know, in the movie you say, you know, the average baby is born with like 287 known chemicals, the umbilical cord blood and all the stuff that's just like, holy, <laughs> holy moly, man. Like what, what are we fighting against? Yeah. But then it turns out that if you just turn around the way you eat and how you interact with these chemicals, all of a sudden this guy's out on the golf course. That's right. And it's what's even more powerful is that we all, we all feel powerless. This problem is so big. There's all these toxic chemicals. The food system is so big. The policies our government's never going to change. So what are we going to do, right? Mm -hmm. The truth is that we have so much power. And, and the most powerful instrument we have to transform everything is our fork. It's the most powerful tool we use every single day. Why? Because what you put on that determines everything about the world. One, it determines what food is grown because producers will grow what you want to eat. If you want organic vegetables, they'll figure out a way to grow that and sell that to you, right? If it affects the environment because you're not using pesticides and chemicals and GMO foods that will destroy the environment, deplete our soils, pollute our aquifers and our rivers and our waterways, that will create climate change by industrial agriculture. You literally will change all that simply by choosing what you eat and then you will change your health. And you'll change, you'll change your health because you'll transform your biology, because food isn't just calories, it's information, right? It transforms your biology with every single bite. It's, it's not just a metaphor, but it really does. So, and your fork will change policy because politicians will want to support the things that you want and you care about because they don't lead, they follow. You know, civil rights didn't start in Congress. It ended in Congress, right? Mm. Women's rights didn't start in Congress. It ended in Congress. Abolition didn't start in Congress. It ended in Congress. It was community grassroots movements that really changed everything. So when you choose with your fork, you, you change everything. I, I want everybody in this country one day to do an eat-in. An eat-in is where for one day we eat only real whole fresh food that we cook ourselves together with family and friends. Simple idea, but it's powerful. Imagine if for one day nobody bought any junk food, nobody went to any fast food restaurants, everybody cooked real food themselves. Wouldn't that change everything? I would create panic. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, this food system, you talked about... Try to, try to, if Hillary Clinton becomes yeah. president, I'm going to have a national eat-in day. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, you have our support on that for sure. That's, you know, this is the kind of revolutionary act that we can do with our own time, our own actions and money that would make a very, very loud signal. Yeah. And, and so we have this food system and everyone feels like, oh, well, where else would I get my food? Um, but there's this enormous industry that's blossoming right now organic farming or organic produce or organic products and and these guys should be rewarded from what i'm hearing uh for doing the right thing yeah and we can do that when we subsidize giant agribusiness with millions and millions of dollars of taxpayer money well we don't give any money for supporting the growth of fruits and vegetables there's no subsidies for those for for corn and soy that are turned into high fructose corn syrup and trans fats that are used to produce industrial food science food like uh, products, 
basically. We, we, we spend billions and billions of dollars, $8.1 billion over the last year. You know, it's almost like $30 billion over the last few years of, of subsidies and support for far industrial farming. But we don't spend any money on fruits and vegetables. The problem is we don't even grow enough in this country. If, if the Americans followed the guidelines from the government, which is eat five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day, there'd be only enough for 3% of the population. <laughs> Come on, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, so we need to change that. And I think, you know, people can, we can decentralize, you know. I think the key here is not waiting for Big Brother to fix it, but decentralize. Mm -hmm. Have community gardens. I was in Atlanta working with Martin Luther King's church, Ebenezer Baptist Church, and Bernice King, his daughter. And they, they showed me this amazing, in the heart of inner city Atlanta, this giant, giant farm that was an urban agricultural farm run by the poor folks in Atlanta who were part of the Ebenezer Baptist Church community. And that was Martin Luther King's church. And I was like, this is amazing. And there was one guy who came up with this idea and he did it. All it takes is one person. And this is, there are pockets of this all over the country. It's school gardens, it's church gardens, it's community gardens. I'm working on Daniel Plan, which is a, a faith-based wellness program. And I'm a Jewish doctor, but you know, like it's, it's <laughs> what am I doing in churches? Because I mean, people need help and where they congregate to get together is in churches. There's 170 million Americans who go to church every week, and that's where people can meet and, and get together. And we know that getting healthy is a team sport. So, so we created this program of getting healthy together in churches, which we had one church lose uh, 15,000 people lose a quarter of a million pounds. And we're launching this across churches in America on January 10th. We're going to have a rally with Rick Warren, and we're going to open this up to churches. We've created a curriculum, a campaign kit for pastors, a meeting with churches in Atlanta and Cleveland, Detroit, New York, really to talk about how we begin to, to empower communities to take back their health. It's really one kitchen at a time. It's one family at a time. It's one meal at a time. That's fantastic. You know, it's part of what we're doing uh, for this movie. I looked in my backyard and said, why am I watering this lawn? And so <laughs> we, we tore this we tore this sucker out. I got uh, six but raised beds. Oh, they're way better than spinach. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's just, you know, we don't even think about it. I'm in Southern California where it's not like the English countryside. Water is one of the most precious things we'll ever have around here. Yeah. So we got six right. raised beds and it's, and it's like my own personal act in my backyard in ball. suburbia, USA. Right, totally. and and everybody can do that. Whether it's on the terrace of your your New York apartment or you know at your church back lot, right? And and so these guys, how do they? I'm, I'm curious, how do they divvy up the food? Is it just is it something that they bring into the church and then they kind of pass it out from there? I think there's different models. There's you know community agriculture programs where people are are donating work for food, so they'll go work in the garden five hours a week and share in the weeding and the planting and the care of the garden, and then they get their food. So there's all sorts of models, but I think it's it's really a community effort, and it's not where you're you're going shipping produce from California to New York, you know. In you know, I mean, do you know that one fifth of our energy needs more more energy than is used for all transportation combined? In other words, for cars, planes, trains, everything is used to grow food and transport food in this country. So one fifth of our energy needs. And the reason we need so much oil is actually to grow food and transport food. So if you're transporting food from California to New York, there's a huge amount of energy loss. There is also, you know, degradation of the food quality. And, and it's just, you know, imagine going to your garden and picking real fresh food. If you ever tasted a tomato from a tomato plant, it tastes totally different than, than tomato from a, you know, factory that made farm that was like a square tomato that fits in a box that tastes like cardboard. But it looks perfect. I want food that looks funny but tastes good instead of food that looks good and tastes bad. Yeah, no kidding. And, and cost a bunch of petroleum dollars to get to you. You know, Thomas Jefferson's probably rolling in his grave right now if you could see what's happening here. I mean, you know, the basis of what they were talking about was an agrar a country that, that can't feed itself is in trouble. And we really moved away from that in a lot of ways. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that, that kind of, and, you know, again, sorry guys if we're sounding US centric for a second, right? Is the. It's global. It's global, it, it's global of course. 80% of the world's type 2 diabetics are in the developing world. We've created the worst diet in the planet and exporting it to countries all around the world. It's not just an American problem. Exactly. And so we, we talk about, like in America, we talk about our democracy being based on like an enlightened citizenry, right? And the citizenry to, to date hasn't known. That's why, you know, doctors like yourself are out there, uh, you know, tirelessly. Man, I, I haven't seen you sit down <laughs> since I've known you. <laughs> you know, you just... You know, there's so much to do, you know, like this, this, this word has to be spoken. The actions have to be done. 
People have to be inspired. We have to. I mean, I gave a talk to 800 African American Hispanic women on Saturday uh, called "Celebrate Sisterhood" about people taking back their health and empowering them to change their lives. 80% of African women, American women, are overweight. Diabe diabetes in the African American population and Hispanic populations are twice that in the white population. I mean, this is this is not just a health issue. This is a social justice issue. It's a human rights issue. Mm. You know, Bernice King talked to me about nonviolence. She says, you know, we, we need to really think about nonviolence as nonviolence to yourself. Mm. If you're stuffing yourself with food that's harming you, that's violence to yourself. And that's sort of expanding the idea of Martin Luther King's ideas. And I think it's it's really powerful. It sounds like it's okay. violence to yourself and also violence to the planet because those foods are obviously doing damage to the planet and you know supporting the chemical industrial complex that does all that as well. Um, I'd, I'd love you know one of the things when when you were out in my office in California and we were filming for this movie, um, you mentioned something that really got me thinking in how this dark time in American history, this time of slavery. Um, was really kind of revolving around the sure. plantations and sugar and how it's like it just it kind of flipped on me. I was like, holy crap, like slavery started this and now we're all slaves to it. Right. Yeah. And so I'd love to talk about sugar addiction and what that what that means for us as a world. Yeah, well, it's a problem. You know, the the, uh, the amount of obesity and diabetes has just more than doubled in the last uh, few decades. And this is not a genetic problem. It's an environmental problem. And the change that happened was that we produced another 500 calories of corn per year, per person. I mean, sorry, per day. Per day not per, yeah. 500 calories per day per person because of changes in subsidies to the corn farmers that encourage them to grow more and more, even if we didn't need it. They would be paid for surpluses, even if we didn't need. It. Normally, if you if you make too much, uh, you know, iPhones and you can't sell them, the price goes down. Here with corn, the price goes up. Mm. It's completely backwards. So that's resulted in this glut of high fructose corn syrup, and it's in everything. It's in ketchup. It's in barbecue sauce. It's in salad dressing. It's in your bread. It's in turkey slices. It's everywhere. Not only the things that we would think they are in, like sodas and so forth. And it's cheaper and sweeter than regular sugar. It actually has more fructose in it, which actually goes to the liver and turns on the fat-making factory, so you actually get more liver damage, more obesity, and changes your biology. So what happens is with the sugar in our diet, we've gone from 10 pounds per person per year in 1800 to about 152 pounds per person per year, plus flour, and we've got to eat about 146 pounds of flour, and flour has a higher glycemic index than sugar. So two tablespoons of table sugar is better for you and lowers your blood sugar, I mean, raises your blood sugar less than two tablespoons, sorry, than two slices of whole wheat bread. Wow. So it's pretty crazy. So when we're eating this much sugar, we found there's something we, we didn't really know. And I, I think the food industry knew this because they, they actually designed food like this. But we're just discovering scientifically that these foods are addictive. And they're biologically addictive. So they trigger an area in the brain called the nucleus incumbens. That's what gets triggered with heroin and cocaine. And it makes you crave the sugar, crave the flour, and you want to eat it more and more and more. So it really subverts willpower. If you know, if I put a gun to your head, and I and I actually said, "Don't don't have your heart rate go up. Don't be scared." You couldn't do it because it's a it's a primitive biological response. When we eat sugar, it triggers this primitive biological response that we can't control. We, you know, if it's a choice between willpower and the chips Ohio cookies, the chips Ohio cookies are going to win every time, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that sugar is addictive and we need to do a sugar detox. And that's why I wrote the 10-day detox diet, which is I wanted people to get 10 days to see what it would be like to actually reset their biology, to reset their brain chemistry, reset their taste buds, reset their hormones. And we know, for example, that the food industry, by Michael Moss sort of revealed this in his investigative journalism, that they deliberately had designed foods to be addictive. They hire craving experts. They have them in tasting institutes to find the bliss point of food, what is that point of, of that food that will create the maximum amount of pleasure and the maximum consumption of that food. And they want to create heavy users, which is their term, literally like a drug addict, and, and get more stomach share. These are the terms they use, insider terms. And so they, they know exactly what they're doing. Stomach it's, share. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's true. And, in, and they, when they disproportionately target the poor and the minorities. I mean, I was, I was in this, as part of the Dr. Oshawa, I went down to this family in Florida, the Stallmans. They were massively overweight. You know, the mother was about 300 pounds. 
all the kids were, you know, 250. And these were like teenagers who were like 250, almost 300 pounds. A little girl was probably 180. She was 10 years old, almost 200 pounds. At 10 years old, she could barely walk. And I found out they were eat, drinking about six Cokes a day. And so I got them eating real food. I showed them how to cook real meals. They started cooking themselves, eating real food. They all lost about 100 pounds in three weeks together. But what was even more amazing when I went down there, and this is really what the food industry wants us to believe, that, that eating healthy is elitist, that it's expensive, that it takes too much time, that it's difficult, and it's, it's not convenient. And, I, and, and so they, I said to the father, I said, you know, how is this? You've got avocados and almond butter and coconut butter in your fridge now instead of all this junk. Isn't it more expensive for you to feed your family of six? He's like, no. He said, it's actually cheaper because we're not buying all this junk food. We were each having, you know, a six pack of soda every day. And you multiply that times six people, you multiply that times seven days in a week. It's expensive. And so they're actually saving money by not eating the junk. How do you start a family? Like right right now, someone who's li- <laughs> someone who's listening to this can say, "Uh oh, you know, I, I don't even want to look in my pantry right now because I know what 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 I'm going to see in there." How do you start swapping things out? How do you start making those changes uh, so that you don't say break the bank and throw all the food away in one shot, but you know, start working your way into a healthier place? Or do you have to just go cold turkey and and jump? Yeah, I kind of. <laughs> I kind of think, you know, it's like if you're a drug addict, you just, mm. you're not going to keep a little bit of cocaine in the kitchen because, you know, you might want to just cut down on it. It doesn't really work like that. Mm. I think if people are really serious, and listen, I eat sugar, I love sugar, and I, but I always say sugar is a recreational drug. It's not for everyday use, right? Mm. It's like I love tequila, but I'm not going to walk around with a bottle of tequila in my hand all mm. day. But we have sugar for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast mm. cereal is 75% sugar. It shouldn't be called breakfast. It should be called dessert. Right, mm-hmm. so so I encourage people to try a reset. Very simple, because when you try to incrementally change, it can be difficult. Now, if you're drinking tons of soda, that's an easy step. You know, just get rid of the liquid sugar calories. That's probably the biggest thing people can do. The second thing is read labels. If anything has high fructose corn syrup on it, get rid of it. Don't even allow it in your kitchen. If it's in there, throw it out. Find something else. And trans fat. If it has hydrogenated fat on the label in the ingredient list. Get it out. Not on the label because they can sneak it in there like Cool Whip has zero trans fats on the label. But all it is is trans fats because they say per serving it has to have less than a certain amount. So the food industry has gotten uh, the, the FDA to allow them to, to kind of have this loophole. So no trans fats, no high fructose corn syrup. You know, those are two steps you can take right away. If it has ingredients that you can't recognize pronounce in Latin or particularly MSG and any of the hidden names, get rid of that because it drives cravings and addiction. So three simple steps can make a huge difference. Just start there, and then you can see what happens. But I encourage people to experiment and try real food. The problem is your taste buds are hijacked, and your cravings are so hardwired, it's hard. You've got to almost reset to start again. We just had uh, uh, someone over at the house. Uh, and the mother's a medical doctor, right? And the kid gets uh, got to go to Starbucks as a treat and got this... I don't know, this enormous double Frappuccino, frappuccino with caramel something. Oh, yeah. And- but- yeah, I mean, it was it was appalling to see how much sugar this kid was having for breakfast, and I and I, and I you know talked to the mother about it. She's like, "Well, what do I do? This is what he wants." Of course, yeah, well, sure. You know, I mean, a crack addict wants crack. A heroin addict wants heroin. Mm-hmm. You know, and those uh, I, I would say Starbucks is not a coffee shop. It's a it's a sugar dispensary with flavored coffee, and mm-hmm. it's essentially a you know uh, uh, seven hundred calories up to seven hundred calories in some of those big frappuccino drinks that these kids are consuming and it's all sugar calories. So it's really, it's no different than drinking Coke or soda. Can we talk about what happens with those calories and why that leads to obesity? Not, you know, let's not get into too much biochem, but just so people understand how that sugar equals fat on the hips or, or on the yeah. belly. <laughs> oh, you know me, you're saying no, no biochem. You know? <laughs> no, I might nerd out on you, right? <laughs> a little nerd. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just give you a little bit of nerdiness. So here, yeah. here's what happens. When you eat sugar, or anything that turns to sugar, whether it's flour, sugar, it, it raises a hormone in your blood called insulin. Insulin does two things. One, it's a fat storage hormone. So it shifts your body into fat storage and a special kind of fat called belly fat or visceral fat. That's the fat around your organs. Second is it makes you really hungry. And third, it ends up slowing your metabolism down. So it's a triple whammy. 
you slow your metabolism, you store fat, and you get hungry. It's the opposite of everything you want to do to stay healthy and lose weight. So what happens is when you, when you raise insulin, all the fuel and sugar that's in your bloodstream gets shunted into these fat cells and gets stored in there. And then in your blood, there's not enough available fuel. So your body thinks, wait, I'm starving. I'm starving. I better eat some more. I better slow my metabolism down. I better store the fat instead of burn it. But on the other hand, when you eat the right foods and cut out the sugar and eat more with good fats like avocados and nuts and seeds and coconut butter, those actually will stimulate your metabolism. They'll actually burn fat. And the biggest fallacy, and I'm writing a new book on fat, so I'm, I'm learning a lot about this more than I, I sort of already knew. And what's fascinating is that we have this problem in our culture of the word fat. The word fat that we eat and the fat that's on our body happens to be the same word but it turns out they have very little to do with one another. Mm. It's sugar that makes you fat, not fat. Hmm. Hmm. That's really interesting. So we have to come up with a new word for fat on a person or fat in the food. Um, because, yeah, that, that misnomer has caused a lot of problems. And the food industry stayed on that for, for a long time. I mean, you guys talked about that in the Fed Up movie a lot. I mean, you know, no fat, no fat, no fat. And, and you know, everyone's on these diets and, you know, going to the gym and doing all this stuff. And simultaneously, America's obesity uh, epidemic was just, you know, going for, you know, going for orbit there. So and it's, it's still, it's still a problem. I mean, I, I was just at Cleveland Clinic, and I, I'm working on every level there. For example, working with the food service, we're going to create the first hospital system in the country with healthy, real food. But right now, they have a policy where they endorse bread as a healthy heart uh, food, which is full of white flour and sugar. <laughs> and yet the meals that I created for the 10 day detox, which are very low in sugar, but higher in fat, like coconut oil and nuts, they won't allow as part of the program because it's too high in fat. Mm. So they ha and, and there was a guy who was actually talking to the CEO of, of uh, Cleveland Clinic. We were at this dinner and he says, I did Dr. Hyman's 10 day detox diet. My cholesterol dropped 100 points in 10 days. My triglycerides dropped 300 points and my asthma, my reflux went away. So we think that it's, Fat that raises your cholesterol. It's actually sugar. So where do you think Cleveland's going to need to go to butter its bread <laughs> after all this? Because the entire healthcare industry is really structured around this this uh, human farm of people that are just putting themselves in there repeatedly. Yeah. So here's what's changing, and you know, people talk about Obamacare and talk about you know insurance reform. And, and the problems with that. But what was in the bill that nobody knows about is shifts in reimbursement to pay for value. That means we're going to pay for outcomes, not procedures. We pay for volume now. The more widgets of humans you can see, the more procedures you do, the more visits you see, the more money you make. doesn't matter if the patient gets better or not. Now mm -hmm. they're going to go, wait a minute, we're only going to pay you if the patient gets better. Mm. In other words, if someone goes into the hospital and has heart failure and they get discharged and their aftercare is bad or their diet isn't changed or they don't, they're not taught how to be healthy, then they come back a week later, the hospital gets another huge payment. Now they're going to go, no, no, we're not going to pay for that guy. In fact, the original payment that we paid you, we're going to take that money back. Mm. So get, hospital, yeah, so, get it right. So, so things are going to change big time. Hmm. And doctors and hospitals don't quite know this yet. A few people who are leaders and visionaries like Toby Koshko understand this. And that's why he wants functional medicine to be the centerpiece of the future of Cleveland Clinic, which is going to show a model of how to take care of chronic disease. They're the best in the world at taking care of acute disease, surgeries, acute medical problems. I'd, ra I'd, no no, I'd rather be nowhere else on the planet. But for the... 80% of people that come in for the for the cost of 84% of the care, they're they're not addressing that very effectively because it's not been part of the healthcare model. Now we're going to start to shift payments towards that, and that's what we're trying to do. Research there to show how do we create value? How do we measure outcomes? How do we measure the total cost of care for a patient? If I can create a program with teaching kitchens, and shopping classes, and community programs and nutrition visits, and lifestyle change vi visits, and group experiences that are highly intensive in terms of human intervention at the front end, but I can save millions and millions of dollars on the back end, you know, right now there's no incentive to do that because if I save a, in a population of diabetics, you know, let's say I have 2,000 diabetics and they cost $4 million a year, 
If I save two million, guess who gets that money? The insurance company. Mm -hmm. They're happy laughing all the way to the bank. The provider, Cleveland Clinic, or me, we're losing money because we're paying doctors and healthcare providers to provide the service, but we can't get the payment to reimburse for our services. Mm -hmm. So we have to change all that. Mm -hmm. So the law has a bit of that with incentives and disincentives, and it's been, uh, you know, it's been a rough road trying to, you know, just navigate the waters of how this law is going to work. Uh, you know, for obvious reasons, and everything that goes through Washington gets a little mucky. But the intent and the gauntlet has been thrown, and so now doctors are taking notice. I really, I, we. We have probably several, you know, tens of thousands of doctors watching this summit as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, let's talk about what functional medicine is and what that means for the future. Because, I, you know, I know that there's doctors right now listening to this who still don't know what that is and they need no. to. Yeah. Well, most people don't know the name of it, but they understand that something's changing in medicine right now. We're, for example, hearing that the human microbiome, this three pounds of bacteria and 500 species of bugs in your gut that we just thought was poop. Like, what is it? It's just poop, right? What, what does it do? But now we know that it may be linked to autism, to depression, to cancer, to diabetes and obesity, to heart disease. So all of a sudden, and autoimmune diseases, and allergies, and eczema, and asthma, and psoriasis, and all these diseases that we thought were, you know, psoriasis is a skin disease, asthma is a lung disease, heart disease is a heart disease. What does that have to do with your poop? But Functional medicine makes those connections. It understands the body is a human ecosystem, that the body is really a dynamic set of networks, biological networks that are all interacting that get out of balance. And that in order to get healthy, you have to get those systems in balance, whether it's your gut or your immune system or your hormones or your body's ability to make energy. These are all critical to be in balance. And conventional medicine treats by disease name. Okay, I'm gonna give you the drug that matches the name. For example, I had a patient that came in to see me who had asthma, alopecia, which is when you lose all the hair in your body. He had inflammatory bowel disease, like colitis, and he had heart, heart issues and hypertension, and he was overweight. Now, he was on drugs for hypertension, he was on drugs for his asthma, he was on drugs for his colitis, and he was on drugs for his alopecia. Nobody said, gee, these are all inflammatory diseases. Is this guy just got bad luck, or is there something underneath this that we can treat the underlying cause. Functional medicine treats the underlying causes. So I said, gee, his immune system's really pissed off. What could it be? Well, there's a short list in, in functional medicine where it's inflammologists, where we know how to think about what causes inflammation. Is it something you're eating? Is it a toxin? Is it some bugs that you're in your gut or imbalances in your gut flora? Or is it an infection? Or is it bad diet or stress or a combination of these things? So for him, for 40 years, he'd been undiagnosed with celiac disease. He had an autoimmune disease that was caused by eating gluten. Stopped the gluten, lost 25 pounds, blood pressure normalized, asthma went away, his colitis was gone, and his hair started growing back. Now, in conventional medicine, nobody's thinking like this. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nobody's connecting the dots about why we get sick. So functional medicine connects the dots, it treats the whole organism, not just the organs, and it's a system of thinking. It's not a modality or treatment or specialty. That's really a new paradigm shift of thinking about how we get sick and how we get better by dealing with the root cause. Well, uh, I want to tease this out just a, a, a bit more here because you mentioned somewhere around, let's just say five for a, an even number of pharmaceutical drugs that this gentleman was on, right? It and was like 15. Eh? <laughs> okay, so, okay, so let's be more realistic, right? Let's just say he's on 15 drugs and he's got insurance, right? Even with insurance, the co-pays on those 15 drugs ends up usually costing more than, say, a CSA or just, you know, going and getting the right food that you say you can't afford. Yeah, it's true. It's true. They, yeah, exactly. If you, you know, and people think, oh, you know, one of the tenets of functional medicine is that food is medicine, that it's not just calories, that it's actually information, and that with every bite, you have the capacity to change your immune system, to change your hormones, to change your brain chemistry, to change your gene expression, to alter protein functions, to do all sorts of things, to change your gut flora with every single bite. And, and it, we think, oh, you know, if you change your diet and lifestyle, you might get incremental benefit. You might get a little improvement. But really, if you're wanting it better, you have to use drugs because they work better. Mm. Well, actually, what we're learning is that's not true. We know, for example, in large studies that you can reverse diabetes, get people off their insulin, reverse diabetes, get them off their, their medications using food. And it works fast. In one week, people can reverse their, their blood sugar numbers. In 12 weeks, they literally can erase 
all the physiologic signs of diabetes simply by changing your diet. There's no drug on the planet that can do that. That's how powerful food is. Yeah, and, and so let's just say you're on metformin, I mean, and you're taking that for years upon years and it's just managing the condition. Uh, I wanna talk about that for a second because there's disease management and then there's what you're talking about, which is actually yeah. curing and reversing uh, you know, the underlying causes. Yeah, so we, we really are, are only like mopping up the floor while the sink's overflowing. Functional medicine is allowing us to go and say, hey, maybe we should turn off the faucet. You know, it's like mm -hmm. we have, we have a, a, you know, a, a couple of rules of thumb in medicine and functional medicine. One is if you're standing on a tack, it takes a lot of aspirin to make it feel better, right? <laughs> if, if you're eating gluten and you have colitis and asthma and, and you have uh, alopecia, it takes a lot of drugs to manage those symptoms. And still you're not better. He wasn't better, he was just managed. Mm. But when we get to the root cause, people get better and their lives are better without actually having to take the medication. So a lot of people who are watching this are, are sitting there nodding their heads saying, holy crap, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm gonna go talk to my doctor. And uh, inevitably what happens is they get pushback from the doctor saying, well, I don't run those tests or I don't do this or I don't do that. How can we re-educate the doctors? I mean, if you're a doctor listening to yeah. this, you know, you need to just go get on, go get on a better education now, like upgrade what you know, because what you know has changed, right? But if yeah. you're a patient, how do you get your doctor either to get with the program, like, you know, get with the times or find a new one? Yeah. So, so I, I'm working in two main areas. The first is is consumer empowerment. I call it self-health. Because I probably 80% of the problems people have with some guidance and, and clear information, things I've tried to do in my books, I've tried to consumerize functional medicine and make it practical and goof-proof. You follow these steps, you get better, right? Mm -hmm. And it works. And people tell me all the time, they come up to me, I, I was in the airport the other day, this guy come up to me and say, Dr. Hyman, you saved my life. I'm like, hi, what do I do? I don't even know you. He's mm -hmm. like, well, I read your books, I followed the program, I got better. So there's a, it's, it's really not rocket science, and most of the stuff you can do yourself. I call it self-health. The other thing I'm working on is physician education and health professional education. And I'm the chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine, and we train doctors all over the world in this new paradigm. And we have a certification program. We've trained 100,000 doctors in 100 countries, and we're building our curriculum and building our training program. And we're partnering now with Cleveland Clinic, which is the biggest provider of postgraduate education in the world to provide more programs. And in fact, we're working with two medical schools, Ohio uh, uh, University and also Cleveland Clinic's medical school, the Learner School of Medicine in Case Western, to reform medical education from the ground up. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's no nutrition education in medical schools. What's astounding mm -hmm. is that of the chronic diseases that affect about one in two Americans, most of them are caused by food, can be cured by food, and doctors learn nothing about food in medical school. So they're ill-equipped to deal with the very problems they're seeing every day in their office. So we're changing that at the root. So we're changing it early on in early education, in residencies, and in postgraduate education. And I encourage doctors who are really interested to check out functionalmedicine.org, check out our curriculum, check out the courses we provide, check out the online education we provide, and really see how you can start to change your thinking. And most doctors go, oh, God, this is what I wanted to do my whole life. This makes so much sense. This is, of course, this is how the body works. I know this is true. And they know, I mean, I, I, I had this doctor come bring his wife to see me and he was this, you know, nephrologist from this academic center and I thought he was all, you know, checking me out and, you know, kind of skeptical. And at the end of the visit, he took me aside. He said, you know, Mark, he said, I just want to admit to you that I know that what I'm doing doesn't really work. I know I'm just putting Band-Aids on things and I'm, you know, we're really failing to deal with the issues and I really want to learn what you're doing because I see this as the future. I mean, I, I mm. just... And I, I'm at Cleveland Clinic, and it, there's like all these doctors in the closet that have been hiding out within the system who are waiting for that moment to come out. It's like, it's like, it's like you know, being a gay man in America in 1950, like everybody's in the closet. And, all this, <laughs> and now there's all these doctors who are really open and interested in a new way of thinking. And when the time is right and when we make it safe and when it's okay, they're going to come out and be part of our army of change. There's been a lot of that because I, I know a lot of doctors, I don't know, maybe like in the 90s that started talking about some of this stuff and, and got ostracized. I'm sure you've been ostracized. You know, how much peer pressure has there been and how's that changing? Uh, and, and, you know, that not only happens on the doctor level, it happens, you know, every day at the office. It's like, what are you, a health nut? What are you eating that crap for? <laughs> you know, 
Honestly, Pedro, well, for me, I, I, I mostly ignore it mm -hmm. because every day I see patients in my office and I see miracles and I mm -hmm. see people's lives change. And I was sick myself and I cured myself from chronic fatigue and a horrible illness. And I know that this is real. And I'm out there fighting the fight. And I just don't even pay attention, to be honest with you. And, and, and it's actually interesting because I'm out there everywhere. And the opposite is actually happening. People are coming to me thankful and grateful and help me and please and can I work with you and I'm like really like you know and I, I, I don't see the hospital even at Cleveland Clinic I expected to go in there and I was like I don't know if I really want to go there because he, it took me it took him two years to convince me to go there because I'm like I don't want to push a rock uphill this, this is going to be a problem but uh, I am so amazed at the openness at the interest at the collaboration we're doing four large research studies now using functional medicine we're working with the asthma institutes and the the Digestive Institute looking at colitis, we're looking at where the neurologist, the top research neurologist in headaches in the world is working with us. So we have resources working and diabetes. We're working with the top diabetologists and experts to really show this model. They're not going, no, we don't believe you. We don't think this is right. They're going, this makes a lot of sense. And let's try to prove it together. Let's collaborate. And I'm just astounded at that response. I did not expect it. That's, you know, that, that's one thing that um, I'd like to emphasize quickly is, you know, I, I, like you, know a lot of doctors, obviously, right? And almost every single person that I've met in that space got into it because they wanted to help people. And you know how depressing it is going to work and going down an algorithm that isn't actually helping people? Oh, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, at a certain point, these guys are like, what the hell am I doing with my time? That's right. And these are smart people, Harvard, this one, now. Most, but most of those doctors that, that we know are have, actually have ODD. <laughs> you know what that is? What's ODD? They're odd. <laughs> <laughs> I have it too. <laughs> you know, we're a little odd, we're a little different, we think differently, mm -hmm. and we see the future. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, the future, the past. I, I just discovered recently an article from 1870. It was published in The Lancet, one of the top medical journals in the world which was uh, from a professor who gave a talk on functional medicine. And he came up with the term in 1870. We thought we invented it 30 years ago. And he was writing about the same thing. We need to think about not diseases as these things that we catch like bacteria, and some of them are, but as, as disordered function in the body. And how do we restore that disordered function to optimal function? How do you create a healthy human? Like that's what functional medicine is. It's the science of creating health. And when you do that, disease goes away as a side effect. I don't treat all the diseases separately. If someone comes with psoriasis and migraines and irritable bowel and joint pain, I don't go, oh, well, let's treat each one of these separately. Or why don't we deal with this problem today and come back next week, I'll deal with the next problem, which is what we do in conventional medicine. I go, no, how is everything connected? What's the story? I had a guy come in yesterday who had uh, asthma. He had arthritis. He had severe cystic acne, and he was overweight. I call it the four A's, acne, asthma, uh, arthritis, and adiposity, <laughs> right? And he was like inflamed and his gut was a mess. And even though he didn't have digestive symptoms, I said, tell me your history. He said, well, I don't remember. I said, did you have any antibiotics when you were younger? She's like, I don't know. I, don't, I think I was sick when I was a baby. I don't remember. I said, well, call your mother. So he called his mother on the phone. We're in the visit. And he's like a 35-year-old guy. I said, oh, yeah. The mother said, oh, yeah. When he was three weeks old, he had this kidney infection. He was on antibiotics for the first 18 months of his life, which destroyed his gut, which led to all these inflammatory problems that developed over time, and he kept on trying to put Band-Aids on them, and now we can actually deal with the root problem. That's fantastic. So one of the things that you know we emphasized in the movie a lot is as you start taking care of yourself, the body starts coming back into order, and as we start doing the right thing for the planet, the environment also starts to come back into order, and it's kind of this as above, so below thing. So these decisions that we're making individually help us as people blossom and have energy and you used to have you know, chronic fatigue and, and disease and here you are, one of the most tireless people I know, just charging out there. Um, how can people start to get involved individually? I mean, as, you know, I know you're doing the, the, the church program with Rick Warren. Where can people find more and more motivation to do this? And, I, and then I want to kind of go into the 10-day detox. I'd really like people to take this challenge um, at the end of this summit. Well, it's, it's really find out what, what you're passionate about, what you care about. Maybe you just want to take back your kitchen. Maybe you want to change your family, start a family dinner every night with real food. 
Maybe you want to work in your school, or maybe you want to start a program in your work where you where you get some colleagues say, let's get the junk out of the out of the workplace and let's have a uh, have a lunch club where one of us makes lunch every week, or if we have fourteen of us, we make lunch once every two weeks for everybody, and we have a lunch club, or maybe. You know, we, we work in our communities and our churches to start the Daniel Plan or whatever you care about, you can start. It doesn't have to be big. It can be really small. Maybe it's just changing what, where you shop and what you buy. And maybe it's starting a, a simple raised bed in your garden. Maybe it's, you know, writing to your congressman or senator about changing food policy. So it doesn't have to be a big thing, but a thousand little things make up a big thing. And I think it's those little incremental changes that are the grassroots that matter and that are going to change everything. And those are pockets of light that I see happening. I, I'm working with Tim Ryan, who's a congressman from Ohio, and he wrote a book called The Real Food Revolution. I want everybody to go get a copy of it because it's a powerful uh, manifesto for a new food system. It indicts the current one and provides a roadmap for the future for a new one. And there's nobody else out there speaking this in politics. And it's really a beautiful invitation of all sorts of things that you can do to change the food system and change your health. That's fantastic. That's yeah. And I highly recommend that book as well. I also wrote a book called The Blood Sugar Solution yeah. and also The 10 Day Detox. And at the, at the end of those books, I write about how we can take back our health, how we can take back our health in our homes and our schools and our workplaces and our communities and our faith based ex, uh, 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 locations in policy in medical school. So I write a lot of, of strategies and ideas about how we can do this. And, I, and everybody can come up with their own. I don't I don't have a lock on this. I just sort of use these as thought starters for people to start to get inspired to change their life and change their community. Yeah, and there's really no stone to be left unturned. I mean, you know, go look in your fridge, go look in your pantry, go see the stuff that's in there and see how much sugar has worked its way into our houses. It's atrocious. Some, a simple thing you can do is go watch Fed Up. You can get it for 10 bucks on Amazon. You can get it on iTunes and Netflix. Invite friends over, watch with your colleagues at work. Get your family to watch it. Show it in your church. Show it at your fitness club. And get people to do this together and watch it. And then get inspired and do a, a fed up challenge or a 10 day detox together. It's not the, the one person doing it, but if we get people doing it at a grassroots level, it's those thousand pockets of, of change and of life that are going to create transformation. Absolutely. And we're going we're gonna to hook you guys up with Fed Up. It's a fantastic movie. And um, it's really, you know, it's really telling it like it is. And uh, we're proud of it. It's just, there's a lot of good work being done right now. And um, we, you know, listen, everyone is now starting to jump up and down and yell and start to get really active about this because enough is enough. You know, yeah. and, and that's it. It's, it's we're all fed up. We're all going back to natural eating and going to our origins and all the things that all of these projects are doing co collectively is saying, guys, it doesn't have to be this way. Right. I mean, I always joke, you know, think about what your great grandmother ate. Everything she ate was local, organic, non-GMO, you know, grass fed, free range. <laughs> you know, there was nothing else. Right. And now we're eating an industrial food. A bunch of food products that are not really food. They're all science projects that have ended up uh, causing huge amounts of harm to us. Yeah, I mean, if you want to support the chemical industry and the petroleum industry and all these other lobbyists that are trying to keep our kids unhealthy, then you could, yeah, go to the grocery store and buy the stuff in boxes. But yeah, yeah cooking is a big thing, and I know you do a lot of it and you teach a lot of it. I do. I, I mean, I. I think doctors should take off their white coats, put on white aprons, and go into the kitchen and teach their patients how to cook because that's what's going to change America. And the other thing people can do is not just about food. You know, I'm on the board of the Environmental Working Group, and, and we provide all sorts of really practical point of, point of service products that can help you make the right choices. Skin Deep, for example. Did you know that most lipstick has lead in it, that there's phthalates and parabens and things in your makeup that are actually causing damage? Did you know that you can buy household cleaning products that are safe to use instead of ones that are poisoning you and creating problems with your kids? Did you know that you can actually choose to buy animal products and meat that, that are sustainable and healthy or that you can buy fish that's not going to poison you with mercury or that you can actually choose food that's healthy for you? They have a wonderful new food score, rate your plate tool that's come, coming out, which is a, an app and an online service that can help you choose food based on its nutritional quality, whether there's weird ingredients in it or not, and how much processing has been involved in making it and you get a score so you can actually scan it at the grocery store or type it in and you can actually see what you're eating and make better choices. So it's really choosing at that level with empowered information that's research driven, very powerful. 
Fantastic. And for those of you who are more interested in that, check out Ken Cook's interview in this summit as well. He's with the Environmental Working Group. And man, they've been a close friend and ally in all of this. Um, th you know, look, guys, there's a lot of good people doing a lot of good work. And there's so many resources. And we're going to put a ton of that stuff in your success kit, but there's so many resources. All you got to do is open your eyes and get to work on it. Dr. Mark Hyman, such a pleasure always. Always. Tell people, tell people how to find you. Oh, you can find me at drhyman.com. You can check out the 10-Day Detox Diet at 10daydetox.com. Follow me on Twitter at uh, Mark Hyman MD or uh, on Facebook at Dr. Mark Hyman. And uh, I hope we can stay connected and I uh, hope you can become part of our health revolutionary army. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I'm sure you've inspired tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people just by watching this right now, and they loved you in the movie. And uh, yeah, just you know, we're gonna we're gonna keep working with you because you're you're out there doing it, and I'm really excited to watch what's happening over in the Cleveland Clinic. That's just that's yeah, that's revolutionary. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we uh, will hook everyone up with your resources and uh, make sure that uh, we keep our eyes on you and uh, keep doing the good good work that you're doing out there. Thanks, Pedro. Me too. Uh -huh. Take care, buddy. Bye.